Uh, today uh, we will have a, a, a colloquium uh, by Professor Una Kim. Uh, she is uh, now is a professor of the Department of Physics in Cornell University and uh, two others affiliation you can see. Uh, let me briefly introduce the Professor uh, Kim. Uh, she graduated uh, uh, Department of Physics of Seoul National University in 1998, if I remember correctly. Then she moved to the United States to get a PhD at the University of Illinois, then spent some time in the Stanford. Then uh, around 2005, she, have been, she has been uh, Cornell, right? So she is very famous for the uh, all the strongly correlated system physics theory. And then nowadays, uh, she also do a very nice works on the uh, machine learning and the quantum uh, correlation. So, so you can uh, ask a question whenever you want, right? So let's welcome. Okay, um, great pleasure to be here. And uh, like Son said, uh, young -woo said, uh, please interrupt me with questions. So I want to talk about uh, machine learning quantum emergence. Um, most of the time, those of us who are studying quantum correlated systems, uh, we are trying to make this link. We want to, uh, we are looking at complex data taken either by scanning probes or bulk probes. This is supposed to be x-ray data. I don't know how well you can see. Or these days also there are databases of calculated or measured properties. So these are all uh, various forms of data that's available to us. And what we want, what we are trying to do, those of, uh, as a theorist, is to gain um, new theoretical insight from the data and um, understand, reduce it, reduce the complexity of data into some ideas, theoretical concepts, such as some ordering patterns or fluctuations here, um, Goldstone mode fluctuations uh, around the bottom of the Mexican hat, or some notion of entanglement. These are theoretical concepts that we, uh, we like to think about, and uh, we feel we have understood something when we can make a um, uh, believable connection between um, complex data and some theoretical insight. And uh, the way to have confidence that uh, what we believe to be understanding actually meant something, has uh, substance, is to be able to make predictions. So we want to be able to go back and forth um, in this, in between these two um, realms. But often, um, increasingly, going back and forth between complex data and simple theoretical insights is becoming difficult as a result of richness in uh, data. Tunneling density of states in 1962 was measured through uh, macroscopic tunnel junctions. Um, for instance, you would put uh, two superconductors uh, interface with a tunneling, tunnel barrier and just measure uh, uh, tunneling conductance, the uh, DIDV. And this kind of measuring, measurement setup uh, offered us a single scalar quantity. For this whole entire sample, there is a single scalar quantity that you measure, and as a function of energy, we uh, get this kind of curve. This curve of uh, density of state as a function of energy is something that is uh, very familiar and dear to the hearts of those of us who have been studying superconductivity. This tells us a lot. It shows the suppression of density of state tells us there is gap opening on the Fermi surface. This chart peak tells us there is coherence. These are salient features, but not only those, but subtler features like these little bumps. Being able to explain these features uh, was uh, what gave us confidence that BCS theory of superconductivity is correctly describing what is going on in the system. Fast forward to today, we do not anymore take a single scalar quantity for a whole sample. Now we can uh, repeat that measurement with a sub, uh, sub uh, angstrom scale uh, 
spatial pres uh, resolution by forming a, a junction that is now formed by a vacuum. So you move the tip around, and at each point position of the tip, you repeat the measurement. And instead of having a single curve, the vertical axis here is energy or the bias voltage. Instead of having a single curve, you can have tens of thousands of curves. Uh, problem is when you have that, if, if you can look with higher precision, higher resolution, you always see more. And uh, what you see more could, infer, could um, reveal critical insight, except that we don't know what to do with that, uh, that much data. X-ray diffraction, um, 1913, this is a paper by father and son Bragg and Bragg uh, in this Nobel Prize winning paper. They uh, developed the very first successful forward model for X-ray diffraction. They saw these peaks as a function of angle as they rotated the sample. And they figured out how to reproduce these features with a model. They said, OK, if I assume there are an uh, array of atoms with forming these planes, then uh, with a single fitting parameter d, I can explain those peaks by uh, considering the interference between x-ray reflected from this plane with the x-ray reflected from this plane. Now, this is nothing but the Bragg condition that was, an, that was an evidence that this model was very successful. It was so successful, we uh, teach this Bragg condition in introductory physics. Fast forward to today, instead of three peaks, we get 100,000 peaks. And not only just the position of the peaks, we can, um, we can understand uh, there is uh, the, all the diffusive features. Um, we have data from um, you know, hundreds, thousands of Brillouin zones. Thank you. Uh, now, having this much more information about the sample should be able to tell us much more about what is going on in the system, except that um, this volume of data is weighing on us. Uh, Stern girl like experiment is something that most of us uh, learned when we first uh, learned quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, uh, introductory quantum mechanics often starts with discussion of Stern girl like experiment um, as described in this plaque. This experiment was a historically very first uh, projective measurement where you see the quantum mechanical nature of the uh, electron spin through the fact that there are two possible outcomes uh, when we project. Each measurement gives us a, a specific definite eigenstate, but the distribution of which of those outcomes come is uh, dictated by the wave function. Now, this was projected measurement on a single spin. Fast forward to today, instead of projected measurement on single spins, now uh, we have a large number of spins or effective spins that are controllable uh, as a quantum mechanical system. This is a Rydberg atom array uh, image taken from uh, a paper by uh, Michel Lukin and collaborators work um, in, from 2021. The point is uh, with this system, the way we access what is going on in this, this many body system is by taking these projected measurements. Now, single spin has Hilbert space dimension of two. If I have 256 spins, I have Hilbert space dimension of two to the 256. That is uh, larger than uh, you know, astronomical scale. And if I want to figure out what is going on in this entire many body wave function, as I was able to figure out what is going on in the single spin wave function, I would need to take many more uh, projected measurements than can fit in my screen. And it will not fit in graduate student lifetime. So somehow, without being able to take the, all the data that you need to be able to reconstruct the wave function and learn the complete uh, quantum many body state of this qubit system, uh, we want to still be able to gain some insert, insight, information um, about what is going on in the system. So these are all data-driven challenges. Uh, 
And the, uh, the challenge that I, and, and our quest uh, as a community of trying to connect between, uh, go back and forth between two-way highway, between complex data and theoretical insight, now we have additional sort of uh, pseudo ex experimental system. Well, it is an experimental system that is realized in the lab, but they're not looking at uh, nature given systems, but these are sort of human set systems. So these are quantum simulator data, such as analog quantum simulators uh, like uh, Rydberg systems or a uh, digital quantum simulator that is gate based for superconducting qubits. Now these systems are presenting us with a new type of data. All around there are uh, abundance of data driven challenges in connecting what has become available in, with our, uh, the insight that we much desire. And uh, what my group have been uh, pursuing for the last uh, six, seven years is trying to use the tools of data science, machine learning tools, to try to make these connections happen better. So these are some examples of uh, various uh, papers that we've been exploring different, uh, different uh, uh, problems. Uh, this is a, a paper on the scanning tunneling spectroscopy. It was our first foray into um, looking at quantum matter experimental data from the angle of machine learning. And to my best knowledge, this was also first successful application of machine learning to quantum material data. Um, we've also looked at uh, with the inverse problem of spectroscopy, such as resonant ultrasound spectroscopy on uranium ruthenium to silicon 2 in this paper. Here we looked at uh, computational data, that is data from uh, Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo simulations of uh, studying a problem where there is a quantum critical point associated with spin density wave ordering and pneumatic ordering. And uh, with machine learning, we've uh, looking at the uh, two point functions. We were able to detect uh, that there is sort of a non Fermi liquid region. In this paper, we used a um, sequence model, uh, model or language model of uh, transformer using attention mechanism. Uh, language models are popular these days, especially with ChatGPT. I don't know whether. Do people use ChatGPT in Korea? OK. <laughs> it, it's all, all the rage, ChatGPT is. Um, so one, par one part of what ChatGPT has to do is to process language um, input and has to learn from language data. And attention mechanism is a mechanism that was uh, uh, very successful in such language learning tasks. We tried using that uh, attention mechanism in this paper to uh, try to reconstruct the uh, density matrix associated with uh, data taken from IBM uh, superconducted qubit system. Here we looked at uh, um, uh, quantum gas microscopy on Fermi Hubbard model simulations. And here we looked at large uh, voluminous uh, X ray data. So these are different, seemingly very different systems and different physics problems. But uh, what we found is that often if we look at these different systems, different type of problems from the angle of data problem and ask what kind of data problem is this? Is this a data problem like uh, image recognition? Is it a data problem like uh, a language model? Is it a data problem like Netflix movie recommendation? This a uh, different angle of asking what kind of data problem is this can uh, help us form the strategy that can be applicable across uh, specific topic boundaries uh, answering different questions. So today I want to focus on uh, just two examples, one uh, that of uh, supervised machine learning and the other that of uh, unsupervised machine learning. But before I go further, I want to um, start by addressing questions that I often get. Often um, I'm asked, did you really need machine learning? So here is uh, a drill. This is a hand crank drill and it can drill a hole. Um, but we don't use that. I didn't use that when I was renovating my house or building my house. 
I use something like this. Why? Um, not only this is faster and more powerful, but also when I change the drill bit, I can take one, one motor and accomplish many different things. So uh, in my view, machine learning is just that. Uh, machine learning tools are tools like uh, drill, power drill is a tool. And it, is, uh, it can only accomplish as much as the user's uh, intelligent purpose and um, safe usage uh, protocols. And all tools, when you get a power tool, there's always a fine print warning sign. And the warning sign for using machine learning tools should be that um, there, often we are taking tools that are developed by uh, different community, community of data scientists and uh, computer scientists and applied mathematicians. And, um, and there can be sort of much more of a black box nature, which is not very congruent with physics culture. So uh, when we use such tools and arrive at some, some results, the only way we can stand by the results and contribute to progress in the scientific goals of our field is to be able to uh, defend what you find based on physics. So uh, in order to do that, I, uh, I tend to advocate for using simplest and minimalistic approaches with minimal uh, bells and whistles and moving parts. And we try to integrate key physics principles and um, not think of this as some sort of competition between human and machine, but try to make it a synergy. Try to get as far as we can with what we know and put machines in an advantageous position. All parents understand if you want your kids to be successful in learning, you want to set them up for success. And for me, um, being that parent, being a parent uh, has been a really helpful <laughs> experience in dealing with my machines and making them be successful. Okay, so let's start with supervised machine learning for hypothesis testing. So, uh, the, uh, what we wanted to do here was to train a neural network to recognize best hypothesis. Something that I encountered a lot when I first uh, entered uh, studying this uh, strongly correlated systems, especially um, high TC cuprates, which was really the problems in high TC cuprates was, uh, were a huge driving force behind many experimental tools and uh, modern tools because there were so many uh, high stakes questions. And among them, uh, among the tools that were greatly developed were STM. What I've often seen um, in the community is people are looking at the same image. And when you look at the same image, obviously you would, same kind of um, impression would register to individual's brain. But brains do not talk to brain directly. Brains, what, what you see, the impression that you get with your eyes that registers in your, your brain, that gets processed through subjective ideas and biases. And somehow everybody sees the same thing, but they wanted to talk about different things. They wanted to um, ascribe different models. Uh, you know, each uh, hypothesis, each uh, proponent of hypothesis will look at the same data with a loving mother's eye and say, you know, one hypothesis looks much likely the underlying the data than another hypothesis. So uh, not being a big fan of personality driven conflict, I didn't want that kind of personality driven subjective fights. I wanted there to be sort of more objective way of telling, okay, what is, you know, most often, what is the dominant feature motif in this data? And try to match those with different theoretical ideas. Those are what I call options one, two, three, four, um, raised in the multiple choice question era. Uh, you know, multiple, multiple choice questions are you know, very familiar things. And we just asked, we wanted to ask the multiple choice question to the neural network. And we thought, well, uh, maybe we can approach this problem the same way one would approach handwritten digit recognition. You can have a database of handwritten digits. Um, there are uh, different possible um, outcomes that one can associate this to. 
And uh, my then postdoc, now a faculty at Peking University, Frankie Zhang, and I, we, were, we got interested in machine learning. We started reading an uh, introductory book together. And then uh, he was going through various you know, practice exercises in the book. And we thought, maybe we can just take one of those very simple shallow neural network and uh, try applying that to the data. And that actually worked. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, how does supervised learning works? Supervised machine learning with neural networks, what neural networks have to do is to make a decision multiple choice decisions. And um, it's just like a kid having to make a decision from my view, my perspective. This poor kid has to make a decision about what to do with what has fallen. What do the kids do? Well, they take input. They look at uh, how long the food has been on the floor. Um, is mom watching? If mom happens to be the bad cop in the family, uh, how sweet is it? Um, how green is it? This is a very important question for my nine-year-old's daughter still. So they look at this data. I have um, represented each of these inputs with uh, vector components x1, x2, x3, x4, because uh, input uh, as such go in as a vector to neural network. And output in this case will be a binary decision, whether you are going to you are going to leave the food on the floor or pick it up and eat it. Okay. So how is that decision made? Well, I don't know how it is made in human brain, but one can um, envision perhaps it would be made in the following way. Clearly, there are different parts in the brain. Uh, there are different parts would have different neurons. There is one, here is one neuron in amygdala, uh, which would take all the inputs but put different weights. Um, I know my daughter weighs these two vectors very seriously, and she weighs them in different ways, okay? So each of the input components will be weighed differently depending on which neuron is looking at it. So different neurons will weigh the different components differently. So there is a matrix multiplying a vector, and there will be bias associated with different parts of the brain, whether it's more reptile brain or uh, frontal co cortex brain. So each of the neurons would take the input and weigh it differently depending on the input and the neuron itself, and there will be the neuron-specific uh, bias. Okay? Now, all of that would, be, would go through some nonlinear function, firing function, and get collected. Uh, and uh, that collection would be once again uh, going through a nonlinear function and arrive at the outcome. So um, what can parents do in trying to influence kids' decision? We all wish we could go into their brain and write their brain, but maybe we don't because we wouldn't necessarily know what to write necessarily. With computers, you know you can go in and write those uh, weights, weight matrices and biases, but you don't know what is the right uh, weights to give. So instead, what parents do who cannot even go in and write, we give feedback, and that's what you do to neural network as well. First of all, what I just described with um, analogy, if I take all those fluff away, what we just uh, described is that is that the neural network, this um, shallow single hidden layer neural network writes this, this function. It's a nonlinear function, takes the input vector, multiply that with a weight matrix, and there is a bias uh, vector, and there's another uh, ve vector involved. And the training is done through giving feedback. So uh, in order to give feedback, you need to have training set that is labeled these are the situations under which it is okay to pick up and eat them, and these are the situations under which you want to let it be. And with that uh, label, you go through the actual experience, and each time what comes out of the neural network will be compared against the label, and you give the feedback by saying whether the outcome conforms or, the, or does not conform to the desired output. Now, with the neural network, the way this feedback, this uh, cost function can be, is what you want to minimize, 
and the neural network will adjust the weights and biases in order to minimize this cost function. And that minimization is done through stochastic gradient descent. And this uh, adjustment rate here is the learning rate. So that's how uh, supervised learning work using neural networks work and neural networks can, can become more and more uh, sophisticated, um, enabling one to write, consider much more and more complex functions, but generally this is how it works. So how are we going to use this? Um, once again, this is a problem that we want to tackle, and this is a team of uh, collaborators. Um, really, this work was driven by uh, Frank E. Zhang, and you can find more detail in that reference. So what is the problem here? The problem here is the mysteries of high TC superconductivity. Unlike a conventional superconductor where there's a single tuning parameter of temperature and mercury goes from being a, a metal, metallic state down to zero resistive state uh, at a single point in TC, um, cuprates and other uh, uh, correlated, correlated and conventional superconductors have multiple here are two different tuning parameters. And not only temperature, you can also tune the hole doping. Now we have two-dimensional phase space. And there are regions that we understand well, such as antiferromagnetic superconductor. Uh, but there are regions that we don't understand well, which is reflected in the names themselves, pseudo gap and strange metal. These are the regions that are much more poorly understood. And what uh, all these experimental tools were developed trying to understand um, these, these two regions better, in particular STM uh, operating at low temperatures was trying to understand what is special about this underdoped region. Um, now there have been um, increasingly many uh, papers experimentally reporting that there seems to be some sort of um, symmetry breaking. But all those symmetry breaking observations always, whether it is uh, resonant um, X-ray scattering or STM, found sort of um, glassy. Glass here is used in a very figurative way. What it really means is a short-range correlated order. It's not a, long, a neat long-range order, but very um, short-ranged uh, structures. Now, when we look at uh, any of those uh, STM data, what we find is that there is some sort of regular pattern. And this is very different from uh, what one thinks of as a charge density wave, which will be sort of a sinusoidal distribution of charge across a long distances. These, uh, these, there are sort of um, characteristic motifs that get interrupted. So the question is, can we discover that? Uh, what can we articulate, objectively articulate what our eyes are seeing? So which are the uh, is the best theory to describe this uh, pattern that we see in the pseudo gap state? And there have been two different starting points. One is to start from a weak coupling case space, and this is my Fermi surface. And um, often people talk about there being flat regions of Fermi surface, which would define a, a sort of a phase space uh, in the momentum space where you can have nesting with uh, this nesting vector. So one idea would be that, OK, that because there are flat regions in the Fermi surface, it's the nesting that's going to uh, drive this symmetry breaking and uh, charge order. Um, alternative perspective is to start from strong coupling limit. In the strong coupling limit of zero doping or half filling, you have uh, all the uh, electrons only on the copper sites. So these are the copper sites. And they form antiferromagnetic order. Now, when, when the system is hole doped in going into that underdoped region, the holes would go to the oxygen site. And we, we can our, um, reason that the holes would prefer to go along a single line because that way they can, uh, and, and they would try to form an uh, antiferromagnet with the copper. Now, from the copper spin perspective, this is an anti-phase domain wall when the coppers originally wanted to be antiferromagnetic among themselves. So this, uh, such, uh, such mechanism, microscopic mechanism driving charge to be arranged along a line that is striped 
would uh, necessarily result in lattice commensurate pattern. Here, the periodicity will be controlled just by the distance between these uh, pieces of portions of the Fermi surface, and that Q naught does not have to have any special relationship with the, uh, with the lattice. But here, because I'm starting from the local limit, position basis, uh, and doping occurring in oxygen sites, again on a lattice, everything must be lattice commensurate. So these are more conceptual uh, and, and profound questions. In the context of the particular experimental data that we have, we turn that question into the question of incommensurate versus commensurate, because that's something that we can answer through a pattern analysis. Now, first thing anybody would say when I show you know, some regular pattern is that, you know, why don't you free a transform? Okay, so let's free a transform. If you free a transform, this is what you find. First of all, there are these broad features, and this is the lattice peak. So the fact that there is weight here says this weight is detecting some uh, modulation, super lattice uh, features. But if I make a line cut along this red line, what I find is this kind of jagged features. Now this jaggedness is not only a result of this being a free transform of finite real space region, but it is a result of there being all these uh, disconnected parts, all the domain, abrupt domain walls. Whatever is abrupt in real space messes up uh, momentum space. So Fourier transform is a poor way of learning about those. So we uh, decided to approach this with, uh, with the supervised learning, trying to um, tell apart which hypothesis best describes the data. Unfortunately, we do not have experimental data associated with each of the hypotheses to use as a training data, and we needed a training set. So what we did was we generated, simulated the training data by using the principles of how a charge order would occur and how they can be disordered. So this is uh, uh, one of our simulated data where we start with the leading modulation periodicity and we introduce a phase disorder that is a smooth, uh, smoothly varying function and phase disorder that has to do with topological defects. Uh, this is dislocations, uh, vortex in the uh, modulation pattern. And these are all uh, phase disorders that we modeled. And then there will be amplitude disorder that has to do with, uh, again, smooth part and the dislocations. So we generated a whole bunch of uh, training set, and our hypothesis about whether uh, one is considering incommensurate versus commensurate entered through the leading uh, periodicity or uh, the um, le leading the Q vector. So my options, uh, multiple choice options one, two, three, four, uh, amount to different periodicities, uh, 4.3 something, 4, 3.7 something, 3.44 something. Now, how did we choose these different periodicities? Those were chosen based on where we see uh, intensity in this region um, with choosing some resolution so that we can have multiple choices. By eye, it's hard to tell this apart from this with our eyes because it's a subtle change changing the periodicity by uh, this much. But the fact that we could train the neural networks to distinguish, successfully distinguish options one, two, three, four, says to the eyes of our neural network, it could tell the difference. So what did we do? After training the neural network to uh, confidently tell different um, training sets, we gave the whole data to the neural network. This, we analyzed uh, decades, uh, a trove of data. Seamus' group have been collecting this kind of STM data over, uh, uh, over a decade, and we've analyzed that entire trove of it. So this is at a particular um, underdoped sample. As we change the energy, um, what is happening as you go from low energy to high energy, and low energy, uh, this is the free transform, and these are the outcomes of the neural network. 
why are they two, there are two bars? We give the data in one orientation and 90 degree rotated orientation. So red is for one orientation, yellow is for another orientation. So at low energy, four options all come out neck to neck. But as we go uh, approach a uh, higher energy of 96 millivolts, option number two starts to shoot up and it's shooting up in one orientation. Once again, option number two is high, option number two is high. Now, if I look at a fine um, grid of energy, what we find is that uh, option number two, the category two, picks up at around 90 millivolts and it remains the most confident outcome. So this tells us there is something special about that particular category. Now, we can look at uh, doping dependence. Um, that is, as we change the whole doping, we're going to walk across this phase diagram. Uh, starting it with the very underdoped data, we're finding the category two, period four, that is the only commensurate outcome um, being the dominant outcome. I'm moving up in doping, period two remains the strongest. Still period two remains the strongest. And now I co go past uh, optimal doping and um, they lose having uh, preference and you can see from uh, free transform or in the raw data that uh, any kind of sense of motif being repeated is lost. So based on this analysis we've concluded that uh, this, the, these sets of data is uh, better described from the strong coupling real space starting point compared to the weak coupling uh, Fermi surface instability starting point because what we found was universally strong um, commensurate order. More recently, um, this sort of a robustly commensurate nature of charge order, this, these are experiments on, on BISCO, uh, bismuth-based cuprates uh, with STM. But more recently, um, uh, YBCOs were found to have also commensurate charge order, uh, yet with a different periodicity of one third as opposed to one quarter. Okay, so that was uh, our uh, first uh, entry into using machine learning on quantum materials data. But this supervised learning comes with some uh, limitations because we decided that these are different uh, training sets that we're going to consider. We decided that these are different options that we want to consider. <clears throat> and um, it left us feeling you know, somewhat unsatisfied. And we wanted to, to explore unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning it, uh, tools are uh, often a way of discovering hidden organization in the data itself. And um, they often take the form of clustering. And that's what we're going to do to look at um, large volumes of X-ray data. This work was a collaboration of uh, people coming from very different domains. Uh, my former student, Jordan Vendeli, was a definite leader of this work. Um, but we also had the pleasure of working with uh, a group at, at, in um, computer science at Cornell with my collaborators, Killian and Andrew. Um, and um, Jeff, who is now uh, a system professor himself, uh, worked closely with Jordan and they together each learned to speak each other's language, language of machine learning and language of physics. Uh, because data came from Argonne National Lab uh, and initially we used data from Chess Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source to develop the tool, this uh, whole project involved people from three different domains, x-ray experimentalists and uh, machine learners and um, theorists to learn each other's language and try to uh, learn to work together. It was a challenging experience, but it was also very rewarding because I felt like we've done something that is actually useful to a broad community. So what can one learn with x-ray? If I have a fully symmetric lattice, one dimensional lattice, with two sites per unit cell and lattice constant A, one thing that can happen is a charge density wave uh, order with period changing. So here, 
uh, repeating unit went from having lattice constant A to lattice constant of 2A. Because now this is a, a repeating unit. And when you go through such charge density wave transition, there will be uh, super lattice peaks that reflects the new periodicity. Here are the super lattice peaks, the new peaks that are showing up. And the difference in the height of these different super lattice peaks reflects the, the form factor. In other words, reflects the structure inside the new unit cell. Now, there can also be intra-unit cell order, which does not change the periodicity as shown here. Um, therefore, no new peaks show up. So difference between this uh, simulation or uh, caricature and this case, the only difference is in the subtle changes of the form factor. Clearly, if this is all that's given to me and contrast, contrasted to this, it is not an easy matter to try to reconstruct what is going on there. That's uh, called, um, that's, uh, that's a, ch a challenging exercise. In many cases, uh, what one would do is to do a forward modeling, consider a, a hypothesis, model forward, compare the model forward with uh, what is observed, and repeat that cycle. Finally, there are fluctuations in, uh, ex in the experimental data. So instead of just having the sharp black peaks, there will be diffuse region around it. And those fluctuations can give us um, uh, critical insight. So this is the uh, uh, data, large volume of data that we are facing. Uh, and it was, uh, because this is not my data, it's somebody else's data, and I empathize with their challenge, but this is equally challenging problem from my perspective when I was a parent uh, during COVID era. So this is an uh, embarrassingly large bin of Legos. And I would be tasked with uh, the challenge of finding a special piece for my kid's project. So now, when you have to sort through this big bin of Lego, and you're looking for a particular piece, your first approach might be to pick up one piece, inspect it, and drop it if it is not the piece that you're looking for. Pick up another piece, inspect it, and drop it. But after doing it for five minutes, you quickly get tired, and after doing it for an hour, you would have an empty bin not having found the piece that you're looking for because you overlooked what you're looking for. Clearly, this is not a good idea. After doing this for a little bit, uh, my family developed a strategy which was kind of an obvious choice. Well, let's first uh, cluster. Let's first group. It, once I group in color or size, and then you can look for that specific piece that you're looking for because you can focus on a small subset once you have grouped. And grouping is much more automatable process. Uh, or we can do it uh, thoughtlessly. And whatever you can do thoughtlessly, if you have to repeat, is better. So we thought about approaching the problem of extra data with the same kind of strategy. Now, uh, the challenge here is if I want to approach exhaustively studying large volume of X-ray data with the same strategy of, okay, let's figure out a way of sorting. We need a sorting criteria. With the pieces of Lego, uh, color or size or shape was an obvious uh, sorting criteria. What could be a, a, a sorting criteria if you're trying to learn some sort of uh, Hamiltonian-driven emergent phenomena? Well, uh, it's the free energy that determines what is going to be realized as an uh, equilibrium state. And Hamiltonian determines my um, energy, but um, temperature will promote entropy. So it is a balance between energy and entropy. Of course, this is something that we all know. So then how do we use this very universal um, principle in developing a sorting category? What we, did, what we realized is that we want to look at X-ray intensity at a particular Q point, particular position. Think of that as an individual in a population. That intensity at a particular Q point will change as a function of temperature. So now we're going to, if I have 
DT number of temperature measurement, 20 temperature, different temperatures for instance, then we're going to treat that temperature series or 20 dimensional vector as a single um, data point. And we're going to look at all the two points as a collection of such data points. What we can anticipate is that there will be different trends as a function of temperature, depending on whether that Q is uh, participating in some sort of ordering phenomena or a special kind of fluctuation or just a spectator, just a background. We don't necessarily know what the temperature dependence has to be, but we don't have to know. That's the beauty of uh, using, using machine learning. We can just uh, process the data and discover. And for this, uh, what we adopted was a Gaussian mixture model, uh, which was first developed as a way of uh, telling apart, uh, detecting the audio sound, voice of uh, different people. Um, and the way this works is to have an assumption that uh, my data will be drawn from um, a mixture of uh, normal distributions, high dimensional normal distributions. Specifically, there, this is a normal distribution um, associated with some means and some variance. This mean is going to be a vector, that 20 dimensional or number of temperature points dimensional vector. And what we are assuming is that my uh, observed temperature dependence of intensity will be a probabili probabilistic fluctuation away from Gaussian, Gaussian distributed away from some mean with some variance. And there are um, K number of different such Gaussians, such as what I described as uh, ordering or, or background or fluctuation. And then we, uh, the, what the machine learning algorithm does is to uh, maximize the log likelihood, likelihood that the observed data is actually uh, coming from such distribution with an adequate assignment to one of the Gaussians. Then we learn this weight. Once we learn the weight, that tells us what is the best way to think of a particular two point. So here is, uh, um, if we want to learn the temperature dependence, one could think, well, why don't we just look at all the temperature dependencies? This is actual plot. This actual plot is, has a large size, file size. This is actual plot of all the uh, intensities over, uh, unit, uh, over a Brillouin zone of different Q points as a function of temperature, and it's a huge mess. You can tell that there is something um, happening here. Apparently there was some uh, a malfunctioning of the equipment right at, at that point in temperature, so everybody went through some abrupt changes, but that's not what we are looking for. Otherwise, it's hard to tell what's going on. Just like when you have two people talking and their voices are mixed together like this, um, it might be hard to tell, uh, tell apart which voice belongs to whom and who is saying what, but um, one way of uh, dealing with such data is this Gaussian mixture model, and one way of dealing with this, it would be uh, our X-ray te temperature series clustering. So this mess, from this mess, one can learn this characteristic mean and this variance for one cluster, and this mean temperature dependent behavior and this variance from the other cluster. Now, if this is presented to uh, any physicist who's learned statistical mechanics in, uh, or thermodynamics in undergrad, they would say, oh, this looks like order parameter, and this looks like background. Now, that's what we've learned. We didn't put in what the order parameter behavior should look like, but this was discovered by try in the process of trying to learn what are two different uh, trends in the data, processing eight terabytes of data. Now, there is no hope in um, being able to hire you know, a graduate student and process eight terabytes of data manually inspected. It's going to take uh, the life, more than the lifetime, and before the lifetime is over, the graduate student would have fled away. So clearly, that's not a strategy, and that's why 
uh, many groups, when they do take these large volumes of data, despite having this volume of data, they will pick some points, pick some cuts, and just look at some fraction of the data, and the rest gets lost. And now we want to do it differently. So where do, which problem do we apply this to? We apply this to the cadmium renate, uh, which is a pyrochlor uh, metal, uh, which goes through different structural phases. And there is this phase transition between phase one and phase two, which has large specific heat signal. Clearly, there is something big happening, but any change in the structure is so minuscule, it's very hard to detect. The fact that there is a large specific heat signal, uh, despite minuscule structural changes, hint at uh, some electronic um, collective phenomena being involved in this phase transition. And it's not unnatural to expect that given that uh, this material involves five dioxides. Now, there are two possibilities for phase two. One is two-dimensional uh, uh, two EU symmetry, and the other is one-dimensional T2U. And um, often it was thought that it's going to be one-dimensional uh, uh, to the, uh, it, one of the options was, uh, was favor, but this uh, experiment uh, uh, by uh, Caltech group uh, raised fresh questions. In order, because these are two, the, the order parameter dimensions are different, one way to tell apart them uh, satisfactorily would be able to detect absence or presence of Goldstone mode. If you have a two-dimensional order parameter, uh, this EU order parameter with these two bases. Even after ordering favoring one direction, there will be Goldstone mode or pseudo Goldstone mode with weak anisotropy. And being able to detect that will tell us that there, it, it's a two dimensional order parameter, much, much more properly describing the uh, structural order in the state. Now, uh, we had eight terabytes of data uh, and one of the biggest challenges uh, in this project was how to transfer that, that volume of data. We give the data to our algorithm, XTEC algorithm, and it finishes analyzing that eight terabytes in 10 minutes. So does that mean we got to write a paper in 10 minutes? Not exactly. Um, after that 10 minutes giving us result, we found the results were puzzling to us. And then we spent next two months trying to make sense out of the result. So it doesn't end with machine, but it always comes back to us. And we have to make sense out of it. What have we found? We found when we average around uh, each peak so that we have small, uh, we can focus on just the ordering phenomena, there are not one, but two clusters, both showing sort of onset phenomena. Both are onsetting almost the same way near TC. But if, so if you only looked near TC, we would have thought that there is only one thing going on. But looking at the entire temperature range tells us there is one set of two points that onsets but stays relatively low in intensity and then shoots up. And there is another that goes up right away. Now, how do we know what these are, and how do we make sense out of it? For, uh, for this problem, it is very simple to interpret. Being able to make sense out of what machine learned is called interpretation. And this is a simple model which uh, allows us to interpret rather straightforwardly. How do we interpret? Well, we look at where these Q points came from. So the Q uh, reciprocal space points that are contributing to intensity looking this way came from these points all marked in yellow. And uh, the cluster that's behaving this way came from all the green points. Now, you don't have to know uh, any detail uh, to recognize there is clear, clearly regularity in where the uh, different clusters are positioned in the reciprocal space. One can just read off from this a selection rule. So the selection rule that we read off um, restricted what could be going on. From based on the selection rule, we were able to learn, okay, what happened in this structural distortion 
is that there was this uh, displacement in upon ordering. This is uh, in the direction, in this particular direction of delta z. And this being the whole unit cell, this is a subunit cell level information, a very small distortion, which is often very difficult to detect by x-ray. Now, after that, we became um, greedier. We wanted to learn more. We wanted to learn the fluctuations. We wanted to see whether there is a Goldstone mode fluctuations. No, that's not how we actually approached. We just wanted to see what's going on. So we looked everywhere, and what we found was instead of averaging over the entire region to represent it with one vote, we allowed uh, the region around each uh, bracket peak to be ind independently uh, inspected. So when we did that, what we found was that the diffuse region around the graph peaks also had different behaviors. There's one type of diffuse region shown in red, another type diffuse region shown in blue. So now we have diffuse regions behaving two different ways and the graph peaks behaving yet another way. And um, just looking at the diffuse region, uh, different, two different behaviors, one showing a lot more fluctuation all over the order phase, the other showing reduced fluctuation in that whole order phase. Once again, we find the same selection rule. Now, this is the part that we were stuck in for two months. And, that, and we uh, eventually understood <coughs> this is exactly what we should expect from the Goldstone mode fluctuation. So Goldstone mode fluctuation that I presented at the beginning as something that one should be looking for, actually we didn't know to look for it, nobody told us to look for it, but that was what the uh, machine learning result um, pointed us towards, uh, although it took us two months to figure out that's how we should think about it. So how do we know this is um, really what's going on? Red and blue are machine learned label of this regions in the reciprocal space point. So let's look at the raw data. In this cut, uh, intensity plotted as a function of temperature. You can see that, um, you can see that there is, uh, there is a, a fluctuation all here Inside that, uh, inside that order phase, here the uh, diffuse intensity is much more reduced. So, and then um, looking at these different uh, degree of uh, diffuse scattering trajectories, we could compare that uh, convincingly against some um, Landau model um, modeling of what Goldstone fluctuations would do. So this is what Goldstone fluctuations would do um, compared to the total um, signal. Now total signal peaking at this temperature of 200-ish Kelvin, that is simply a reflection of the fact that uh, that's a critical fluctuation. There is a second order transition at that point, so you'll have a lot of fluctuation right there. Typically, this is all you get. You don't get a lot of diffuse scattering in the order phase because it is order phase. The fact that we have a diffuse scattering and more dominantly on some peaks over another peaks is consistent with um, this particular type of Goldstone mode fluctuations. And this was, to the best of our knowledge, first detection of pseudo Goldstone mode fluctuations from X-ray data. So to summarize, I uh, this gave, um, I described sort of two example cases of supervised machine learning um, using char learning characteristic motifs in image-like data and gaining new insight. The new insight in this case was that uh, the entire data set over different ranges of do doping all are best described by period four commensurate uh, modulations, which is what one would expect from sort of a lattice uh, strong coupling local perspective. 
And I've also discussed uh, unsupervised machine learning example where we used, uh, we developed a clustering tool called X-ray Temperature Series Clustering, XTEC, uh, to, to uh, discover what is going on as a, a emergent phenomena in large volumes of X-ray data by looking at the evolution of data as a function of temperature. Um, supervised machine learning allows us to uh, weigh different uh, promising ideas against each other. And unsupervised machine learning allows us to focus on interesting regions in the data and discover things that were buried, buried in the volume through a needle in the haystack problem. Um, before I um, end, I want to sort of step back and think about where we are with machine learning, ap applying machine learning to quantum condensed matter, quantum matter data. This is uh, an image of Jacquard Loom. Um, this was this kind of, uh, of um, automation or uh, machine, machine um, introducing machines into weaving is what enabled uh, middle class or lower, even lower class to afford rugs or fabric. Before this, this, this loom was invented, every household had to weave the fabric that their family, family is going to wear. Now, uh, what's most impressive is this whole mechanical uh, apparatus, but actually, the key thing about this image is right here. This loom, this jacquard loom, allowed middle class and even you know, low class people to have rugs with pattern. If you go to any museum in Europe, you will find this um, tapestry hanging on a ceiling with you know, the rugs with various patterns. And being able to um, maintain an intricate regular pattern required an artisan effort. But when you can code how to weave, it became something that is much more affordable to everybody because it could be mass produced. When, Anna, when other people saw this loom, they thought of industrialization. When Ada Lovelace saw this room, loom, she thought maybe these punch cards can be used to program the machine, the so-called thinking machine her friend was making. And we know, although Ada herself didn't get to see the machine to be uh, made, therefore she didn't get to program it, historically, we know eventually when we have computer, Initially, the computers were programmed with the punch cards. Now, um, these group, this is an image taken from this wonderful movie called Hidden Figures. And these are human computers who predated a machine computer. Um, and they were um, human, um, colored human computers in the West area. Uh, there were uncolored or white human computers as well. Um, according to the movie, um, man, most of the, many of the computers lose, lost their jobs when a big machine computer came in. But these people uh, went from being a computer, being computers, to programmers, and they kept their job. Because um, Dorothy Vaughan, who's leading them, had a vision uh, to learn to program instead of being just um, scared of the machines. So uh, on that note, um, thank you for your attention, and um, I'd be happy to discuss any questions. Okay, so question comment, please. So let me start. So, you know, if you use a chat GPT, then uh, put the question like the What's the, what will be the result of the president election of 2024, something like that. Then ChatGPT surely will tell you that, sorry, I don't know, because I have learned all the data from, uh, from the old last uh, data till the 2021, something like that. Right. So, so it's a, a machine learning is a, it's interpolation, not the extrapolation. Absolutely. So, so 
for your unsupervised learning, mm -hmm. it means that uh, you have somehow kind of learned your pseudo Goldstone mode theory. Mm -hmm. Somehow you don't know, but your machine learning already uh, has this one in your data, right? Mm. Because the machine learning cannot be extrapolated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in such a sense that you can pick it up the, when you do not notice very well, but you cannot predict genuinely very new one from I machine agree. learning. Yeah. Right? So I just wonder what's your opinion that you know, using machine learning is just to pick it up with some specific one, you cannot notice it, or mm. you just you can use it to make a new prediction or entirely new physics out of that. Yeah. So um, uh, ChatGPT was not developed by DeepMind, um, but it was developed by OpenAI. DeepMind's um, pursuit has been to come up with an intelligence, um, and that is more like trying to create something new. Uh, what ChatGPT does is not trying to create something new, although we throw questions at it, but that's not what it was made for. What ChatGPT shows is uh, where these machine learning tools can really excel. That is in learning what is in the data. It learned, it didn't have any data post-2021, so it cannot answer anything about post-2021. But if you ask about what happened up to, up to 2021, it has read much more than any of us have read. So it can find things that's in what we haven't read. Um, and I, I think it's a great example. Uh, it, it really uh, begs us to look at, to think about what we can ask of machine learning um, and rethink about what we can ask of machine learning. And, and perhaps the right way to use these tools, and, and this is actually how the machine, uh, um, computer scientists and machine learners think of the tools. They think of it as something that uh, can learn, what, learn the data. It's a data science tool. And um, now, uh, does that, is that uh, meaning, is, is that less glorious job than creating new data point, right? Um, well, uh, perhaps, but whether it is glorious or not, that's not what it is meant for. And um, there are, F so then what can you do? It, um, you, it, it interpolates clearly, um, and you would never find what lies outside of what you've given. And if you want to use it for, as an interpolation, of the points that you have not in interrogated yet, which is what uh, many uh, some ammunition community is trying to use new, use it to learn, say, new pseudo potentials, or you know, so, so molecular dynamic community is also using it, and and I think uh, that you can use it to generate something that uh, uh, that that is new or not. Um, calculated or not measured, that is uh, so-called generative modeling. Um, generative modeling based on enough data can look pretty convincing. You know, you cannot tell a generative human face from a real human face these days. It, it looks convincing. Um, what is the value of that? I think the value of that is when you absolutely have nothing else, perhaps. So. Um, Trying to uh, extrapolate and model what could be a reasonable guess for some device size system, which you just cannot compute based on what you can compute in a smaller size. Well, because for device size system, your option is either nothing or something approximate. Perhaps that is the reasonable place where such generative modeling can be useful. But um, my personal, um, I, I am more conservative than that, and I am personally trying to go after problems where data has been generated, 
and we don't have good ways to look at them. That's right. where I think uh, most uh, soundly beneficial things can be accomplished. Okay, great. So any other questions, comment, please? Uh, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So, uh, I have a question about how you use the machine learning in the first part of your talk. So, mm. you, you said that yeah, you had already uh, two candidate theories. Four. Saying, yeah. uh, four, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Sorry. Four categories. Two candidate theories, right? All right. And, so, mainly commentary and in commentary. Right, and then, right, right. Mm -hmm. for given parameter set, you input the uh, image data to mm -hmm. decide to let the machine decide whether which one is the best. So you yeah. prepared for candidates. So right. my question is, yeah, that's a very nice word. But uh, as a, uh, we are all, I, I, not all, but yeah, we are physicists. So we could be wondering uh, what insight, what physics insight can be obtained from the machine's decision. For instance, mm -hmm. you said that yeah, you obtained a new insight from mm -hmm. yep. the complex data. Mm -hmm. and. For instance, the uh, the machine said that this is the winner, and mm -hmm. then, and then is that all? Or so uh -huh. I'd like to know some specific example of what you had learned more mm -hmm. after you obtained the machine's uh, uh, machine sensors. Yes, uh, um, great question. Um, so, so that was our when was that paper? Sorry. Um, that, that was 2018. That was already a couple of years ago. Um, we had the same desire. That is, it is unsatisfactory to you know, um, say, OK, you know, this is what the machine learned. That's great. Well, that's a, that's a starting point, but that cannot be the ending point. You want, actually want to learn what it learned, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, because ultimately, in, in a way, this is data fitting. And just because you're fitting data well doesn't mean you're right. You might be fitting data well for right reason, or maybe you're fitting data well for the wrong reason. You never know. <clears throat> so what we uh, developed since then, since that work, was um, trying to introduce more interpretability. And um, it, is, it is interpretability. There is always a trade-off. The more expressive your machine is, it's got more moving parts, and it's harder to figure out where what is happening. <clears throat> but we have taken. I'm not going to give a whole new talk, but I'm just going to flash a couple of slides. We've taken uh, the uh, uh, very typical convolutional neural network, and we kind of simplified it so that <clears throat> the nonlinearity that, that typically happens after the so-called convolution step, that you put it through a nonlinear function, such as uh, rectified linear or sigmoid. Instead of putting it through a full nonlinear function, we put it through uh, different powers of the convolution. So that um, any, once you have anything other than linear power, or it is a nonlinear function, therefore you gain some expressibility. But when we separated different powers of the convolution, and, we, and then we studied after training the neural network, this is on a different type of data, uh, quantum gas microscopy, but it's the same kind of image-like data. What we did was we uh, studied how which, which of the inputs or which part of the input gets used first, like here, when we uh, starve the neural network from using lots of inputs. We penalize neural network from using a lot of inputs by introducing this regularization. And when, uh, when, this, uh, when this one of the lambda is small or when lambda is big, there is a big cost to using any of the inputs. So what the neural network will do is it will try to use minimal amount of input to get maximum benefit. So then here we see that it started using this particular input. It's a fourth order correlation of this filter. And at that point, the accuracy went up to 0.75 from 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is random guess. 0.75 is a meaningful um, learning result. So this told us that this particular correlation was the most beneficial thing for the neural network to arrive at a, at a particular decision. And by being able to learn which kind of correlations 
were dominantly used for making the decision, then we could then look at that piece of information and say, what does that teach us? And in this case, we were able to look at that piece of information and say, oh, this is consistent with this idea of a particular theory. And that's sort of the direction that we are going in my group now. We are trying to have, all, we are trying to have interpretability. We're trying to always interrogate what was learned and why does that make sense. So, so more questions? Okay, uh, thanks, thanks for the nice talk. I have a question about uh, dynamics because what you have been showed us is static measurement where mm -hmm. time average is the output of the, but the, there are more, I think there are more data in the dynamics itself. So mm -hmm. is there any a development of uh, measuring some time reserve measurement and then the, try to get something out of that the time reserve data because it's uh, important and also very hard to do something out yes. of the, yes. this time reserve measurement. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So, um, we have a lot of interest in um, studying such, such problem, dynamical data. Um, so one, I, I have been talking to some colleagues about looking at dynamical data. Uh, we haven't had uh, actual, you know, none of the casual discussions led to, you know, actual you know, work yet. Um, but um, that's a very interesting question. Now, um, Voice recognition is clearly a time series. Our sound signal that I showed earlier, that's a time series. And when we give a command to Siri, Alexa, whatever, <laughs> it's not free of transforming, right? So I think this language model, um, sequence model, it's called looking at a sequence, time series, it is a time series. Sequence models that's been developed for uh, voice tra uh, uh, dictation, uh, tasks could be a good strategy for uh, analyzing time series data or dynamics data, but we haven't yet had a uh, uh, actual project. That's the idea that I've been I've had, and I've been wanting to do that. But uh, usually, the, the way our uh, the way projects go is that I need to have data at hand. We can developing a method, even if it is starting from some well-known method, developing method uh, is impossible without data because we, we, it's, it's a very um, hands-on process. It cannot be done in abstract. Uh, only when we actually work with data, we find what, wor what works and what, what doesn't work. And always there is like big part of effort going into, okay, how should we process this data? How should we feed into what architecture? None of that can, decision can be made until we have data in hand. And so far, I haven't had somebody approach me with a pile of time series data. So first requirement is to have a data with a specific data-driven question. Second requirement is there should be a interesting, well-defined scientific question that one wants to answer with that data. So um, it's kind of like a consulting business. <laughs> when you come to me with those two requirements, then we can sit down and talk about it. But I would love to look at a dynamics data. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so I don't know the uh, detail of uh, the physics you talked about, but the, I have a just question about the uh, I mean the data. So at some point you mentioned that you were uh, uh, given uh, eight terabytes of data from the experimentalist, but uh, do you need all this data, I mean eight terabytes? Let's say I just reduce the, this whole data into like uh, eight megabytes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still, you get the same answer or no? I mean, so it, it, at the end, you, your 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 information you extract from from these uh, eight terabytes of data is kind of uh, in terms of size of information very small. You, yes. you just recognize the uh, uh, identify the which uh, uh, site is interacting with which site, and you so show some some pattern, right? So. 
So, okay, um, <coughs> uh, uh, STM data was not eight terabytes. You cannot get eight terabytes of STM data. It was only, I don't know, not even, maybe a gigabyte. So what this is, is a result of that reduction. Clearly, this is kilobytes. So I reduced eight terabytes into a kilobyte. But before we came up with this method, there was no other way of faithfully reducing a terabyte into even gigabyte. Because that's exactly what dimensional reduction or compression is about. Now, um, MP3s are a faithful compression of an audio signal. And that was possible because there was a good algorithm for doing that. With the X-ray data, there wasn't such a process. What you can do is to say, okay, I'm just going to look at the Bragg piece and ignore all the, diff all the diffuse signals. However, the location of the Bragg peaks, when you have high resolution, it's not just one location, it's several pixels. Then you have to pick by hand and in each, for each Bragg peak, which pixel are, are you going to choose? How many of those pixels are you going to choose? When you have hundreds of uh, Brillouin zones, this uh, information uh, here, this information about the intra internal structure, uh, the form factor information, these are different, different Brillouin zones. So you can discover this when you look at multiple Brillouin zones. So you want to look at multiple Brillouin zones. So what the point is, it is a very non-trivial data reduction or dimensional reduction or compression problem. And that's what this algorithm does. I think you are uh, uh, given uh, multiple copies of data, no? No. Uh, just one, uh, I see. So it can be very high resolution data. Very high resolution, see, see. high intensity X-ray, uh, very large number of real zones. So nothing is redundant? No, it wasn't redundant. Nothing Thank was you. redundant. Yeah. Yes. It's a dilemma of having high resolution, expensive instruments. Uh, all the, you know, Europeans, American government agencies listen to the demands for we need higher resolution, we need brighter beams. There are instruments named brighter beams. Okay, so you get brighter beams, you get more data. Now you got to deal with it. You don't know what to throw out. I, I question of two questions. First is, uh, to, to based on the analysis of your yeah, machine learning model, they, they can give the some some the, some evidence to the ground state. Or the, there are two two phases, right? Yeah. Is there any some evidence to which page are more possible in the I, 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 I exactly don't know the controversy of this system, but my, if my subject with this is a hidden order page is issue, issue is a hidden order in this page, right? Um, it's not exactly hidden order. So this was about so-called pseudo gap. And there was a lot of discussion, this debate about whether there is even any kind of ordering or what, whatever it is, what the heck it is. It just looks very puzzling. It just doesn't look like anything that you've seen before, before to pray. And uh, what our results said um, was not, it was, it was not uh, um, as definitive an answer as this is the mechanism and this is what is going on. But in trying to understand this uh, non-trivial uh, phenomena in very puzzling part of the phase space, people always asked um, whether they should start from kinetic energy. Hamiltonian has kinetic energy and interaction. Kinetic energy takes momentum as the basis. Interaction takes position as a basis, and momentum and position do not commute. So do you want to start from taking interaction first and then try to move away from it, 
Or do you want to start from pre-fermions and start uh, Fermi surface first and move away from it? These are two, two different perspectives because theoretical approaches starting from those two fixed points predict very different things. And what we were able to say is that a decades collection of data on underdoped cuprate favor this perspective of starting from strong coupling perspective. As opposed to uh, Fermi liquid instability perspective. Oh, cadmium uranium. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yes, right. So, there we found evidence of uh, Goldstone mode fluctuations. And Goldstone mode fluctuations are only possible when you have two dimensional order parameter. That is one of the two possibilities. Therefore, we are supporting the two dimensional order parameter EU structure. Sorry, I, I think I misunderstood your question. Oh, thanks for your nice talk. And my question is about your first part of the talk. And can you go to the page number 37? Page number 37. <laughs> OK, uh, page number 37, yes. So if you take a look at this data, I mean, the, the, your main conclusion is that even in the underdog regime, the strong coupling limit theory is the one which explains this phenomenology the, the better, right? Mm -hmm. Then the weak coupling limit. But if you take a look at your figure there, is, is it also possible that the, the, the role of the weak coupling theory is important even in these cases because there is non-negligible weight in the case uh, category one and three and four. Mm. Okay, now that's, that's the realm of interpretation of what to make of this. Um, well, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it, we interpreted this as, well, if, if I just look at this page 37, this is already approaching the optimal doping, right? So ordering, any kind of order organization is becoming weaker. But um, there were two things. As you dope, what happens? As you dope, your Fermi surface evolves. Because your Fermi surface evolves, what is the leading uh, motif should change. And we are not basing our conclusion that this um, points us to think from strong coupling picture, not only on the fact that category two was leading one, but the fact that it is consistently the leading one um, at, at all the while we have strong presence of modulation. Earlier approaches of manually trying to fit the, uh, you know, what people typically did before us was they look at this distribution and they draw a circle and find the center of the circle. And they say that the center of the circle changes. Okay? Now, clearly, this is not a circle. You know, what radius you put will change. And, you know, where you define the boundary of the circle changes. So, based on that, people drew evolution of the representative wave vector, the leader wave vector, the thought leader of all those intensities to be changing as a function of doping. And what we are saying here is that we looked at uh, a decade's worth of data over all range of doping, and always it is one commensurate periodicity that is a dominant motif. It's not changing. Thank you very much. Yeah, so do not judge by yourself. Yeah, ask chat GPT. <laughs> okay, so, so it's because of time limitations. Uh, let's finish this time. So let's thank speaker again. Thank you.